This will be our 14th message in the table of the Lord. <clears throat> the Lord's table and the table of devils or demons. Now some truths, some truth makes for enlargement. It is when you focus on it on the surface, it doesn't look like it's that profound, but as you peer into it, pretty soon you see that there's a lot here. So this is a little deeper than I thought it was. It's like a pool whose waters are dark, and so you can't really see how deep it is. The Lord's table, is that's, it's like that. When you look at it on the surface, it looks pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And so not a lot, men tend not to say very much about it, just occasionally. But there's a lot here, infinitely more than I've plumbed. And you want to be alert in your, in your personal life. You want to be alert to texts like this. That there's more than meets the casual eye. Yeah. All these sort of things are missed by casual readers of the scripture. They just, they just can't see things like this. Because it, the scriptures are the sort of volume, the volume of the book, as the scripture would say. That it, it doesn't look like what's there is there. It just looks like, you know, 66 books and so forth. But actually, the scriptures are in us. There's a sense in which they're like an introduction. <laughs> and that's how, see, there's actually not very many words that just directly address the Lord's table. There's, you pretty well cover them and just without taking a breath. You, you could probably say about all of them. But there's a lot here. And so that's what we want to we want to probe into this saying that uh, Paul throws out in 1 Corinthians 10 before he actually gets down to an extended comment about the Lord's table. He just throws this out. You cannot, not you should not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Yeah. You can't take what Jesus offers is sip on it for a little bit and take what the devil offers. This, this, this can't be done. So people that really, they, they decide I'm going to give like a half hour or an hour to the Lord, and then I'll do what I want to do. This, the Lord won't let him sit at his table. Amen. You cannot... Be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. It's impossible. You really can't go to church and watch the Super Bowl. Got to sometimes bring it down so people know. <laughs> you can't really go to youth meeting and play games. You, you got to kind of bring it down so people don't understand what you're talking about. You can't really meet in the name of the Lord and then have a gossip supper. It, You cannot partake of the Lord's table. Why can't you? He won't let you. Well, some people try and do this anyway. So he throws out this question. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? You're going <laughs> you're gonna to try and aggravate the Lord by partaking of the devil's table and his table at the same time? Are you stronger than, are, are you stronger than he? You? <laughs> I don't know that a lot of people know this. There's a lot of this going on. This is why, quote, church doors are closed Sunday night. Yeah. Let's get right down to it. This is why. Right. It's because they're trying to eat at two tables and God won't let them. He will not give these people anything from him. Okay, that's what we're going to look at here tonight. Now, in the scripture, a table is a place for food where you eat. 
And God structured it. He talked about it in this way, so you'd know about it. In the tabernacle, <coughs> Exodus 25, 30, he said, Thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Then after it had been in the, before him for seven days, then they could eat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot there. We won't go into that right now, but there's a lot there. After it had been on the table seven days, then the priest could eat it. Amen. He had to be uh, sanctified. Well, huh? the things you partake of, like how long have they been setting before the Lord? Right. It's a thing to think about. Then, the, 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 just the way they talked about a table, what we're pointing out here, 2 Samuel 9, 7, David said unto him, this is to Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son that was lame in his feet, Fear not, <coughs> I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee to the land of the Saul thy father. Thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. He saw a table. He's established a table. This is, this is a place you, where you eat. You ingest. You take in. Something served up here. 1 Kings 2, 7. Show kindness unto the sons of Barzillaiah, the Gileadite, and let them be of those who eat at thy table. Psalm 23, 5. He said, The Lord, he prepares a table before me. He prepares a table before me in the prince of my enemies. It's not a table for artifacts. That's right. It's not a display table. It's not where crafts are shown or books are placed. It's a place you eat. Amen. Luke 22, 30. He said, talk, Jesus talked about eating at my table. E e you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. <laughs> I just like the sound of it. Yes, You'll eat and drink at my table, said this to the twelve, in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tri You mean eating is connected with reigning? That's what he said. Yeah, yeah, amen. You shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes. So here, oh, and now you find out that this is like just a meal. There, here he tells him that it's associated with judging and evaluating and pronouncing judgments. You eat at my table. <laughs> so you see, tables are established for eating. Now there, it's a place where food is ingested. Something is ingested at these tables. That's right. Table of the Lord, table of devils. Something's taken in. And you know, even in nature, what you eat becomes a part of you. It's the same with these tables. People eat at these tables, change the way they think, change the way they see, things change what they do, why they do it, where they do it, when they do it, change it all that. Now let's look at these two tables, two different tables, two different meals ingested, two different things served up. A man's made to eat. That's right. God made him that way. He can't survive if he don't eat. So the physical constitution is made that way, and but it projects the spiritual constitution. The spiritual makeup of man is made so he has to take something in to sustain his spirit, to sustain his mind to sustain his thoughts, to sustain his ambitions, his judgments. He has to take something in, man's made to eat. So he's got to partake of one of these two of these tables. You can't function independently of eating what someone else has prepared. That's just the way it is. That's how God made. <laughs> he made man a dependent creature both physically and spiritually, or in the body and out of the body. He's made him to have to depend on what somebody else provides. Yeah. <laughs> now, our text is telling us two people have made provisions for men to consume what they've got to offer. Yeah. Listen, Satan's not a salesman. He sets a table. 
God, he's not a salesman. He sets a table with the Lord Jesus. Sets a table. This is how deity functions. This is how your enemy functions. The enemy doesn't knock you in the head and take you captive. He serves the meal to you. Makes you eat it. Makes you desire to eat it. <coughs> but you can't function on your own resources. Now that in itself is kind of a revelation. A lot of people think if I just hone up what I... But I'm able to do it. I'll train myself, and I'll take a course in this, take a course in that. Pretty soon I'll be able to function. This is not how God made you. The one who supplies you has to be an invisible resource. It has to be somebody that has more than you have. And there's two personalities that are mentioned, the Lord and the devils or demons who work for the devil. <coughs> And you can't feed simultaneously from these tables. <laughs> you take a little, little help in what the Lord offers, little help in what the devil offers. I see not everybody knows this. I remember when the hippie generation invaded the country, you know. And it was a generation that tried to eat at two tables. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, they introduced this thought. They introduced this thought to eat at two tables. You can eat at two tables. If you can eat at two tables, then you can talk about the things of God in carnal language. That's eating, trying to eat at two tables. You can try and adopt the jargon of the world and then use it to talk about the things of God. That's trying to eat at two tables. You can't eat at two tables. You can't feed them simultaneously. <clears throat> Both tables are serving up what the host, whoever the hosts the table, what he offers is on the table. That's what he's serving up. So let's look first at the Lord's table. Something's being served up here. Yeah. This isn't just something like you do. Although you do, do it. Something's served up at this table. There's something you can obtain at this table that isn't at anyone else's table. Now Jesus said that, he said this, this is a, my body and this is my blood and Paul expounding on it he said that it's the communion mm -hmm. First Corinthians ten sixteen. the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ some verses will use the word fellowship This table is where you participate mm -hmm. in Christ's body and you participate in Christ's blood. What does that mean? <coughs> <coughs> you gain the advantage of whatever that body, whatever that body did, mm -hmm. and whatever advantages are associated with Christ's body, you gain those advantages at this table. Yes, Whatever advantages are declared to be associated with Christ's blood, you gain those advantages when you mm -hmm. fellowship with his blood. Now Satan, uh, the Lord, as I said, commented on these two tables. <coughs> And then the apostles elaborated on it. Let's look, first of all, at the body. This is my body. It's the communion of the body. Now, John, give us an idea about what, what we're talking about. We're talking about the body of Christ. The word is made flesh. Uh, there's, there's the body. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's a bunch of stuff here. It means in Christ's body there's glory, right? We beheld the glory. When he's in a body, we beheld the glory. And there's grace. That's, it. That's in the body. Full of grace and truth. That's that he's in the body. Full of grace, full of truth. So here's at least three things that are involved in the body of Christ. You've got the <coughs> the 
the glory, the glory of God is in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. You, you didn't say you just like see it. You, you, you fellowship in it. You, the glory was in the body. That's that Christ became a man so you so Christ's glory could be visualized. Yeah. You could actually yeah. see it. And you could define it. Yeah. And you could investigate it and probe it. Yeah. See, otherwise it was it was out of reach. And the grace of God is dispensed mm -hmm. in his body. And he showed you how it worked. He, he, while he was in the body, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. See, they, people, they just like to touch his, to touch his clothes. That was uh -huh. just to touch his clothes would heal people when he's in the body. Mm -hmm. now, that wasn't at Sinai. That wasn't the case. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that kind of glory, it wasn't a bodily glory. It was a glory that scared people half to death. So I'm showing you out there this table, the body, whatever is connected with Christ's body, you touch it here at this table. Now, Paul said in, the, in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Oh, oh there, there, so there. Oh, so there, the fullness of God was, like, who can explain it? Everything that God is, everything God has, everything God gives is is in Christ. So his body, it's bodily in him. It's in his body. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. For our sake, it's it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have, we couldn't access it if it wasn't in his body. Now his body is glorified, but it is a body. See, mm -hmm. and you participate in this fullness at this table. Mm -hmm. And Peter, he takes it a little further talks about his death he said he he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed I don't want to get caught up in the definition of by whose stripes you were healed it's talking about bodily healing yeah. it's not what it's talking about right. Because the next says you were a sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So the healing is inside. All right, now that's something connected with Christ's body now. He bore our sins in his body. So the, if you, as you ingest the body, you fellowship in the body, your awareness of sin, like, begin to, to diminish. You begin to sense they've been taken away. I can remember them. I, I vividly recall my own involvement in it, but your conscience is like purged from dead works Amen. to serve the living God. And you become dead to sin pretty soon as you're eating at this table. Now we're talking about your, your fellowship in his body. As you eat at this table, fellowship in his body, you find yourself dying to sin, that if sin's not appealing anymore, it's you find there's not a, a lively connection between you and sin anymore. Sin can't dominate you anymore. Mm -hmm. And you begin to live under righteousness. That's what the text says. We live under righteousness. And you are aware of the fact that you were, you were healed. You're not what you were. See, so there's a lot in fellowship with his body. Is it not the communion of the body? So you, you actually participate in all those things. <clears throat> And the blood of Christ, of course, the accents on the blood because that is a sanctifying element. Romans 3.25 said he's set forth Christ, that is, he's made him apparent to the world. Mm -hmm. Set forth Christ to be a propitiation, a merciful covering for us. Yeah. Through faith in his blood. Through what faith in his blood? Yeah. Now, one of the esteemed scholars of our fair community, who was a key teacher at one of our fair colleges in this community, said that that really doesn't mean faith in the blood. Now, he was an advocate of the Greek language, and I asked him, well, what does the Greek say? Well, the Greek says faith in the blood. <laughs> you trust the efficacy 
of Christ's blood Amen. when you eat at this table. Now, you, you can't do this if you don't, don't have fellowship or communion with the blood. You don't get this benefit. And this table, this, this is the place, this is where it happens. So this, if you're going to doze off, this is not the time to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to be distracted by the children, this is not the time. Yes, yeah. This is not the time. Yeah. We're, we're fellowshipping, fellowshipping with the blood of Christ. And then in it, it declares that the propitiation he set forth to declare mm -hmm. his, God's righteousness for the remission of sins. Did, did God forgive you because he loved you? He loved you, to be sure. But yeah. he forgave you because he's righteous. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. To declare his righteousness uh -huh. for the remission of sins. So when you sit at this table, you commune at this table, this becomes more apparent to you. Maybe you... You couldn't put it in words, but now you just hear someone just say a few rudimentary things about it. Oh, all of a sudden you can, you can put it together and you see, whoa, this is marvelous. The things I have access to when I sit at this table. Again, Romans 5, 9 says, much more being justified by his blood. Remember, this is the communion of the blood. Being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So what... Part of being justified is knowing you are not going to be condemned. <laughs> Some people, they say they know they're forgiven, but they're not quite sure about how it's going to go at the day of judgment. <laughs> but you can be sure about this. But you have to commune in this. You have to have the fellowship of this table. Ephesians 1 7, remember you're communing with the blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So suddenly... Begins to dawn on you more and more. Well, I was forgiven not because I did this or did that, not because I've been successful in regimenting my life more. I was His grace. That's what did His grace. And grace, like, can strengthen you. See, grace is not wishy-washy. It strengthens you and teaches you. Having made peace to the blood of His cross, Colossians one twenty says. So here, when you commune with the blood. This becomes more apparent to you. At first, it's like intuitive. You, you kind of sense you're at peace with God. You, you sense when you're in God's presence, he doesn't condemn you. But now this, remember, there's some things you look into it, it's deeper than you think. And like that's a bigger thought than you at first think. And as you dwell upon it, this peace begins to reign in your heart. That's a little little, little bit of the fellowship or communion of the blood of so the body and the blood see there's a lot a lot in there all that he said about his body all he said about his blood this becomes you participate in it now, salvation is depicted as a feast mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a place where you eat and <laughs> do a lot of eating it's salvation that's how it's depicted a feast participate in a lot of nourishment in prophesying about it, Isaiah said, Isaiah 25, 6, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow and wines on the leaves well refined, a feast. Place you eat. Eat a lot. Again, he said, Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. 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 Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Well, some people, they didn't come to the tables. They said, wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? How come you wasted all your time pursuing things that don't really satisfy? Yeah. Say, well, I have to. No, you don't have to. And, you're, and you labor for that which satisfieth not. See, the world it doesn't give you something for nothing. You got to serve the world for it ever sets a table for you. 
You got to determine to serve the devil. I mean, that's not how the person who's serving him looks at it, but that's how it really is. Before the devil puts something on the table. Hearken diligently unto me and eat that which is good. Come on over to my table. That's God talking to people. Come on over to my table. Partake of what I'm offering. Do it. That's the Lord's table now. It's a feast, banquet. Now the devil, he's, he sets his table too. He transforms himself, Paul says, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, into an angel of light. Now, he's got things that physically, we might say, look like what's on the Lord's table. Yeah. But, but it's not. He'll offer satisfaction. He'll offer advantage. He'll say you'll be wiser. You'll be like God's. That's what will happen. Yeah. And his, his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Uh -huh. We want the best. We want the best for you. Yeah. We've worked on this plan and we know that you'll be closer to God if you follow this plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't say you'll be better in the world, but you'll be closer to God. Uh -huh. You follow this plan, you'll have more grace. Mm -hmm. You'll have more peace. You say, no one says that. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yes, yeah. they do say this, too. They offer, see, they're all, but it's the devil's table. Because yeah, right. of the devil's table, you never really are satisfied. At the Lord's table, you, you're satisfied. Amen. And you have a sense that you've been nursed. Yeah. The devil's table, you never have this. You, yeah. Yeah. The druggie will tell you it's never enough to take one shot. Right. Yeah. Got to keep taking more. Why? No satisfaction. The alcoholic, the booze, the drunk, they'll tell you that you know, you're not satisfied with one drink. You got to keep, keep taking it. The adulterer, you'll see, you know, it's not, you can have one tryst, you know, one fleshly tryst and one fling of the flesh, but you'll want another, and pretty soon you want another. See, his never satisfied when you eat at his table. Now, he disseminates food at his table, but it's all summarized in lies and deceptions. That's kind of summarizes it. Jesus said about the devil, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you'll do. He was a, he was a murderer from the beginning. He'll kill you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Yeah. And abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own. He's a liar and the father of it. So he, he misrepresents everything. Revelation 12, 9 says of him, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That's what's at his table. How does he deceive them? It's at, this, at his table. That's where he deceives them. As you begin to sit at the devil's table, you get a good dose of his deception. Pretty soon you're thinking, well, that's not as bad as I thought it was. Or God's a loving God. He'll understand why I slipped and fell a little bit. It's deception. It's not the truth at all. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? How would you feel, you husbands, how would you feel if your neighbor was trying to lure your wife? Would you say, oh, whatever will be, will be? God doesn't say that either. Amen. At all. So the devil, he serves delusion and so forth at his table. <coughs> now these two tables are the means whereby a person is what he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these two tables make you what you are. They have to do with character and thought and purpose and preference. All that's cultured at these tables. Sometimes you'll see someone you knew, and all of a sudden, they're going after the things of the world. You wonder, wow, what's wrong with them? They have preferences. You don't like them. You know they're not right. They're listening to the wrong music. They're making the wrong friends. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing that? They're eating at the devil's table. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 
That's why they're doing it. You see somebody else and their, their attitude toward God is growing. They want more of the Lord. They have a desire to walk with him and be pleasing with him. And you can see it. You can see it. What's happening? They're eating at the Lord's table. See? That's, that's why that. Oh, I love it to think about it. It's good to think about it, isn't it? <laughs> see, what a person is reveals the table they've been sitting at. I mean, you like, may like to be charitable and say, well, you know, they just didn't understand. and They'll grow out of it and have all these excuses, but the truth of the matter is they were eating at the devil's table. You eat at these tables. When you eat at these tables, you're consuming what the host of that table is offering. These tables are what we call antithetical. They're the opposite of one another. And at no point can they be joined together. Yes, Satan will make an attempt to like set them side by side, but there's a great gulf between them. <laughs> the devil can't have a holy table, and the Lord can't have an unholy table. Well, that means there's no such thing as a carnal Christian Amen. or an angelic devil mm -hmm. or a holy devil. Or an unholy God. Well, you just as well think that that's possible as to think a person can be a worldly Christian, yeah. a worldly-minded Christian. Yeah. No. See, that's saying you can eat at both tables. Mm -hmm. You can see that, I'm sure. Yes, amen. Do you provoke? He asked this telling question. Do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Just the thought is frightening. The Geneva Bible says, do you provoke the Lord to anger? See, some people can't imagine God being angry. They, they can't, can't imagine this. The Amplified Bible says, to jealousy and anger and indignation, it just says this is bigger than the English language. It doesn't have a word to show what it is. See, where there's love, there's of necessity jealousy. Yes, that's right. They both will go together. That love is what makes a person jealous. God's name is jealous. I'm sure you, you do this already, but it's quite a thought to consider. Exodus 34, 14, thou shalt worship no other God. All right, now what that's, you bring that into the new covenant, it's saying you shall not eat at anyone else's table. See, that's the same, same type of thing. Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Don't think he's going to overlook it. That's right. <laughs> Some people tend to overlook this because maybe it's their children. Mm -hmm. They say, well, you know, I know they shouldn't be that way, but I love them. They'll probably come around. This is not how God is. This may be how you are. This is not how God is. He's jealous. He'll do something about it. He may just pack up and leave. Forsake him. And after providing an effective salvation like God has done, a salvation that brings glory to God and freedom and release to the people, Jesus is not indifferent mm -hmm. when men slight his table Amen. and choose the devil's table. The devil's table takes different forms. Sometimes it's like a picnic. Other times it's a sporting event. Other times it's a hunting and fishing. It, it, it takes different forms, but it, what it amounts to is that to participate in what the devil's offering, you got to forsake what God is offering. Uh -huh. And to partake of what God is offering, you got to forsake what the devil's offering. And now you you have to work this out. This isn't for me to work out. I got my own salvation to work out, fear and trembling. But this does have to be worked out. Amen. A person has to decide when he chooses to do whatever he's doing. Where did I get this idea? Whose table was I sitting at when I got it? Mm -hmm. And I have to follow through with this. <clears throat> it's 
So he's provoked for men to not eat his supper. Now, lest men uh, think this isn't so, Jesus provides a parable. It talks about it in Luke 14, verse 16. This is right after he said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's the preceding verse. Eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man bade many, made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And the all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Now listen. When you tell someone about Christ, and they reject it, Tell the Lord about it. Tell him what they did. Tell him. Say, Lord, I gave to them what, you, what you've given us. I told them about salvation. They didn't want it. And Lord, I'm bringing this before you. God knows it already, but the man that one that told, made this feast, he probably knew this too, but he, he told him, the servant told him <laughs> these things. And the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes to the suppers on the table. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. The servant said, Lord, it's done as thou hast commanded. And yet there's room. <laughs> Table's not full. The Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways, hedges, and compel them to come into my house and I'll be full, filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Amen. All right, this is the Lord's table here. There's some people Jesus will not let eat at this table. Right. Amen. They may go through the mechanics of it. I understand this. But he's not going to let them have the communion of the body right. and the communion of the blood. Now, this answers a lot of questions. Some of us spend a considerable amount of time among people that are spiritually dead and lifeless. Why were they that way? Jesus would not let them eat at his table. We know that's the case because at his table is a fellowship a communion of the body and the blood. So there's benefits that are realized. So if a person appears to be sitting at this table and appears to be eating this table, but no progress is actually taking place, Jesus from heaven has stopped him yes, that's right. from participating in his body and blood. He will not let him do it. Amen. Now, I don't mind telling you, brethren, we're talking serious things yes. here. But that's how it's represented in the, in the record. No person will be able to detect the devil's table till he's eaten at this table. You'll see it, or you'll see it, particularly in seasons like we have now. Oh. During these kind of seasons, the devil spreads, he puts a spread out there. We'll have a little bitty Jesus. We won't have, we won't offer you a mature Jesus or one that preaches or one that teaches or one that dies. We'll offer you a, a, a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, that's so nice. It's such, so beautiful. When I contemplate the babe Jesus, I'm staggered mm -hmm. at how low he came. Yeah. Uh -huh. You couldn't get any lower or more vulnerable or more dependable dependent on somebody uh -huh. than a little baby infant that's, right. that's a pretty long distance mm -hmm. for someone who created all things and 
for whom they were created. That's a long fall for somebody to come. So that's not what... He doesn't set a manger on this table. It's part of the humiliation. I understand when you talk about the body of Christ, that's when he entered into a body at that time or in the womb, when he entered into a body. That's, that's part of it, an essential part of it. Make no mistake about it. But if you want to eat at this table, you've got to get down to the body and the blood. Yes. Amen. Not the blood that was in his veins, the blood that flowed. Mm-hmm. It was a bloodletting. The cross was a bloodletting. So I ask you, which, which table do you eat at the most? It's just something you have to examine yourself. To which table do you sit at? Are you wise enough to see what the devil offers? Particularly if you're young. If you have a hard time determining what the devil's offering, what then talk to somebody that can tell the difference. They'll be able to say, "Oh, this over here, this thing you've been listening to, and this friendship you've been making, and this." That's from the devil's table. Mm -hmm. And if you follow through with that, the devil will deceive you, and you'll end up in hell. Mm -hmm. Or someone will say, well, I've been having these desires of God, but I want to be righteous. That's what the Lord's Lord's offering. You're sitting at the Lord's table now, that these desires are wedded. So it's a telling question, isn't it? Do we provoke him to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? No. But if we'll sit at his table and reject the devil's table, you have no idea how much he'll give you.